What's good, everybody? It's your boy O'Shea Duke Jackson back at it again with another episode here on the O'Shea Duke Jackson channel. And I'm just so glad to have you brothers here today. Give yourself a round of applause. And we're back here. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, people requesting the return since me and Dr. T.S.N. Johnson did an interview a few days ago. And I did reach out to him. He is back today. And I will let him introduce himself and what his YouTube channel and his uh, his work is about. Uh, what's good, people? Hope everybody's well. Uh, Dr. T. Hassan Johnson. I'm associate professor of Africana Studies at Fresno State. I am a lead scholar and founder of the Institute for Black Male Studies. And I have the Onyx Report. Um, you can find the Onyx Report with Dr. T. Hassan Johnson right here on YouTube. So that's what's up. All right. And I, I do thank you, brother. I know you, you're a very busy person for coming back and, and talking to us. Um, last conversation uh, that we had uh, mm -hmm. centered on how the system started the gender war between black men and black women. Right. But to make it more of a personal and I know you're an academic and, and I'm, I'm asking you a lot for this particular topic, but you touched on it on your on your page. So I figured that I might. Uh, you know, be a, a be a nuisance on the topic, and that is a lot of African American men, despite being looked at as uh, guys who are sexual conquerors, guys who have a lot of game, a lot of swag. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of our brothers uh, with doesn't matter what their you know age or education or looks are. We have a lot of African American men that are in sexless relationships or marriages. Right. Right. Okay. Now, how did how do we how did you even come up? I saw you talk about this a little bit on your on your page. How mm -hmm. did you even come up with this particular idea idea or topic? Well, I mean, I went through it myself. I mean, uh, I was married for nine years. I was with my wife for eleven. She passed away about uh, twelve. It's about about twelve years now. But um, at the time, we were married for nine, and the last five of those years were pretty much sex. But not only sexless, like regard no intimacy at all. I mean, no. How you doing? No hugs. And we just really at a, we're at a point where, as a, I heard it in a movie once, we were like two strangers running a small daycare. I mean, it, it's pretty much where it had gotten to. And the brother who I was interviewing on my show, the reason I, I brought him on is I was interviewing him prior to that in another medium. And while I was setting up, we started talking about it. And he had actually gone through it for 10 years. So he was just coming out of out of a marriage where he was in it for 10 um, I, you know, I have uh, other friends who've gone through it for the same amount of time, multiple friends who've gone through it for up to 20 years. And all of these brothers are accomplished, intelligent, degreed, capable, and, you know, in their fields, they're, they're what, you know, high value, hundred thousand plus and, and consistently so, but, you know, once they got married, everything changed. So, yeah, this is something that I've heard, um, for a while, but how do you think? I mean, I, I mean, I know that you, you talked about it yourself, but if you can estimate, because obviously a lot of black men, if you were to ask them if they're having sex with their wife, I mean, most guys probably would lie. But how often do you think uh, our brothers are going through um, such a such a relationship or a marriage? You know, it, it's hard to say specifically on the basis of race, but I can say, you know, Newsweek magazine, you know, framed it around 15 to 20 percent of relationships are sexless relationships. Um, you know, studies show that 10 percent or less of the married population below the age of 50 uh, have not had sex in the past year. And in, in addition, less than 20 percent reported having sex a few times per year or even monthly under the age of 40. So I can't tell you in casual conversation how many brothers I've talked to where they can count on one hand how many times they've had sex in, in like the last two years. Some of whom are married, some are in long term, you know, uh, uh, relationships where they're monogamous. And, it, you know, yeah, it, it's it, I think it's more frequent than we think, because in many ways there aren't a lot of places for men to go to talk to, you know, to talk to people or even each other about that. Like no, most of the time those conversations start because, you know, I, as an academic, I just put things on the table and just, you know, engage people. But a lot of the times these brothers don't talk to anybody about it. They're just living in these silent hells and, you know, have, there's nowhere they can go with it. Um, and, and, and it leaves brothers with, with very few options. Cause I know, mm -hmm. you know, when I was going through it, I only came to, I was like, there's three conclusions. I can either bury my head in the sand and just pretend 
like nothing's wrong. And, and I know a lot of brothers live in that life, you know, where they are just every and they'll tell you I'm happy in every area of my life. I just my wife won't let me touch him. Um, so you could just bury your head on the sand, act like nothing's wrong. You can cheat and hope you don't get caught. But contrary to popular you know, belief, not everybody is a master player. Most people end up getting caught on one level or another. And then you end up running into uh, what you dealt with with the lead attorney in one of your prior videos. You, you divorce. That's the third option. So those are like the three major options. There is a fourth option where if you have the, the wherewithal, you might be able to negotiate with your wife into like an open situation. But, you know, it, it, that that one's a bit precarious. It depends on the person. Well, those are the only options that I found at the time. And I wasn't I wasn't interested in seeing my son every other weekend. I wasn't interested in getting divorced, you know, because of the repercussions. I was I was concerned, you know, about a lot of that. So a lot of guys I like meet are afraid to get divorced. They're afraid of what can happen to them if they do. And that's the other thing that gets real twisted about this, man, is that even though they're married and their wives are not interested in many different instances, they will still get punished. They're why, you know, so there's still a kind of a possessive thing that takes place where, you know, if they get caught cheating, she it's all out, you know, in terms of what kind of punitive, you know, practices she can bring to bear on him for, for stepping out, even though she ain't touched him in, in X amount of years. It's an it's a it's a it's a confusing dynamic, but you know a lot of guys find themselves in those situations. We just don't know how to talk about it or who to talk about it with. You know. Let me let me ask a question because you know when when I when I when I've heard women, um, especially like black women, that may have said you know well the reason why um, I'm not having sex with him is uh you know he you know he cheated on me. And, um, and right now, and and I and I, and I and I and I'm hurt, and I'm still haven't found the the, the way to get back with him in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know that could be. I mean, it sounds like a. I won't even say it's like the 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 because I mean I can understand for like about you know a month or two or so like that, but like for years, I don't understand that. But do you? But in, in many cases, why are some of the reasons from the men that you? Have, I know you've experienced it yourself, but. What were some of the reasons that these men, because obviously you talk to your wife or you talk to your your partner about this sexist relationship that's going on or no intimacy. What are some of the reasons that the wife gives as to why they don't want to do it? Uh, there are a number of reasons. Um, some that she'll give, some that she won't, some that you figure out. Uh, but mismatched sexual libidos, lack of communication, childbirth, uh, antidepressants, uh, hyposexual um, uh, desire disorder or low sex drive, uh, history of sexual abuse. You know, a lot of women deal with that where they've been sexually abused, raped or violated even when they were young. And a lot of men deal with that as well, by the way. Um, uh, so porn addiction, uh, grief, uh, you know, the vaginal dry, dryness, even due to menopause, uh, body image issues, um, financial problems, you know, all of these things contribute to the dynamic. But you raised a significant one, and that that's that's trust. Now, sometimes there's a reason where that's in place, you know, where if you stepped out on her and she doesn't trust you, sometimes it, that you've done nothing and she just doesn't trust you for her own reasons, whatever insecurities might be at play with her. So even when we say trust as an issue, as far as where women are coming from, it doesn't necessarily mean that a man has done something. It can simply mean that she believes he has or is worried about the fact that she has and she's withdrawn from him emotionally and disconnected. And, you know, often there's no conversation about it. You know, it's kind of, you intimated this a little bit earlier. It'll go from a few days to a few weeks to a few months. And, you know, it, it, and I know in my situation, you know, I tried everything. I tried conversation. I tried candlelight dinners. I tried therapy. I tried arguments. I thought, hey, maybe I'll piss her off and <laughs> she'll say something. You know, at the end of the day, I, I, you know, I never found out. And I've I've engaged a lot of brothers that just don't know why. Um, even after therapy, couples therapy, you know, still haven't been given a straightforward reason. So there are some reasons that you can kind of, you know, pull out. And there are situations sometimes where you just never find out. Um, and it just is what it is. So and then a lot of people stay in their marriages because, you know, they got kids. And I, and I found this to be the case with black men in general. And this is also. In, in relation to the brother I had on my show talking about it, uh, Dr. Gamble, they stayed in their marriages mainly so that their kids could have some kind of functional framework. 
Because mm-hmm. part of the problem is, and I think this even contributes to sex- sexlessness in marriage, we, most of us in the Black community here in America, we're not raised having seen a functional marriage. Most mm-hmm. of the time we haven't. We don't know what it looks like to deal with someone every day. We don't know what. It, 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 how is it different to argue with someone that you're married to every day uh, or disagree, you know, or, or show affection? We, we don't see that. What we have is television shows, music videos, people coming into relationships with imaginations. And this is where it gets deep. You got people who have been, especially women, I've noticed, who have been imagining what marriage is going to be like since they were four, four years old. You know, so this is a 25, 30, 35 year old woman, sometimes even their 40s. And they're getting married for the first time and they're bringing to bear all of these ideas about what they thought marriage is. And so are we as men. And a lot of times it's just a lot of miscommunication, a lot of misdirection. We don't often know how to talk about what those expectations are. I mean, I've seen brothers get married and one brother in particular, his wife quit her job one day and she was making six figures. He was making 40. She quit her job and came home with a box of her stuff. And he was like, what are you doing? She said, well, I quit. And he said, well, why? She said, well, because you're supposed to take care of me. And he was like, well, you know, I make $40,000 and she, you know, and so over the course of a few months, she got, became more and more frustrated at the quality of their lifestyle. But it, she didn't do the maths. It didn't dawn on her about that. What she was responding to was the belief she's had since she was five that her husband was going to be this magical guy who was going to make her to take care of her and live this lush lifestyle. So even though logically it made no sense, she wasn't functioning on logic. She was functioning on this longstanding fantasy that she put to you and had never talked to him about. He had no wow. idea until she walked in the door with a box full of her stuff. So this is how marriages can kind of play into this as well. We come to the table with deep seated beliefs that aren't some, you know, aren't realistic at times. And we've held on to them for decades, but we don't often know how to talk about it. So this kind of impacts us. And then something uh, Kevin was talking about very recently, Kevin Samuels, he was talking about the ways in which uh, women are socialized to, to hold off on marriage until they put their careers together and get to a certain level in the black community. And this has you know, a seriously negative effect on marriages. It generally leaves a lot of women unprepared uh, and competing with much younger women. And much of the time they lose out on that. Uh, the, the standards tend to be very unrealistic in terms of what they're looking for. And as he points out, they price themselves out of the market. But another dynamic, another aspect to that in regard to sexless marriage, even when they do get married, you're talking often about women who have had uh, years more experience than women that get young, that get married younger. So they've had more experience. They've been with a variety of different men, you know, that impacts their ability to pair bond. But on top of that, they also have this bar on what they believe to be the daily amount of excitement they need in a relationship. And when you get married, married life is a whole different pace. You are not yeah. at the club every week. You are not right. traveling around the world every week. It is it is a slower pace. And so you have some people that have gotten so used to functioning at a certain level. You know, it's, it's like playing video video games for 12 hours and then trying to read a book. You know, that's, mm-hmm. it, it, you can't, it, uh, the, a lot of people can't make that transition. And that's what exactly. seems to happen. So the, the marriage is viewed as boring. You know, uh, the sex, uh, you know, it, familiarity breeds contempt already as it is in, in terms of human nature. So you, you're with the same person every day. And so, you know, sometimes and this can happen to men, too. You just get bored. That can be a factor. You know, so there's like, and, and, and another factor. Um, and I don't have any statistics on how often this happens. Some women enjoy the power dynamic of being mm-hmm. able to not only control when and how often sex occurs, but they'll use sex as a form of uh, reward or punishment based on whether or not she can control him to the degree she would like to. So that that's a factor nobody wants to talk about. Because when you really look at the marital industry, like the counseling and therapy industry in regard to sexless marriages and sex therapy in general, a lot of it is by women for women. So if you if you Google sexless marriages, what you'll find are a number of articles written by women and female therapists. And many of them are designed to protect women's reputations, protect women uh, at all costs, uh, uh, try and de- try and defeat and, and, and downplay arguments by men in particular about their wives it, it's set up in a way that's very pro woman it's very gynocentric and it's inherently misandric to varying degrees because it comes in refuting and fighting with men who don't really have a place to say look my wife shut down and i don't know why and i haven't done anything to her i'm doing everything i'm told to do and it's making it worse if not keeping it the same 
See, so so even the therapeutic industry, the, the you know, counseling and therapy industry is catered around women. It really, you know, and I went through this even individually, not not even just on a collective fashion. I'm talking about it on even on an individual basis. We couldn't find very many male, let alone black male counselors. Uh, black male counselors are maybe about one percent of the industry. And when you get to a point where even your wife, who's upset at you during a therapy session, can turn and look at you and say, "You know what? Damn, that therapist is really anti-male." <laughs> when your wife can say that in a counseling session. That lets you know, you know, you're dealing with a therapist that that has been trained in a way where they only see things from the woman's women's vantage point, you know. So that and that's kind of it's structured in to the very framework on how many of them are trained. You know, they're trained from a vantage point of you know women being victims of male uh, aggression and so on and so forth. So they're trained in a way where they're coming in looking to defend women in many instances and get men to see the problem from women's vantage point. It's very seldom balanced. Let me let me ask you this because you said um, that in you know in, in in certain brothers' cases, we know we're not talking about average guys here. We're talking about guys who are highly educated, who you think they're well sought after. Because a lot of times in the manosphere, what you hear, not from everybody, but like you know, hey, go out there, earn a lot of money. Mm-hmm. You know, and you know, you know, improve yourself, get in shape, earn. Women are going to be all over you. Right, right. That was the promise. That's what we were told. Right. Yeah. Which is which is why you know guys like me and you from the West Coast is why we work so hard to try to get to where we're at, and mm-hmm. only to find out that oh. Sh- <laughs> so how many how many guys do you think that I mean, and, and we all know that because we think that this is a, a class issue. The more money that you have, you don't have to go through this. You know, mm-hmm, you don't mm-hmm. have to have these problems because if you're a high value black man, right. you're not experiencing this. As a PhD and, got, and you have a, you know, a illustrious um, number of, 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 of colleagues and stuff like that, how do you think that class is a big factor in sexist marriages? You know, I don't, I don't personally think so. I, I think part of the issue we're dealing with is how marriage has been redefined, particularly since the 1960s and 70s, right? Really 70s is is post second wave feminism, because what second wave feminism basically did is it taught it taught women that marriage in and of itself was a form of slavery, right? Uh, That you were especially, you know, white women in the suburbs, you were living in living in gilded cages. You know, you were were, if you were married and, and you had to service your husband. And service could mean anything from cooking, cleaning to having sex. So this kind of view that marriage was inherently uh, a negative is kind of what we had in West in, in, in Western culture. And it really merged and, and took hold. Right. And what it ended up doing is it by the time you got to the 1980s, you, you started to see this new dynamic where women could like if you took took labor, women could work full time, part time. They could work from home. Not at all. Be a housewife. You know, it, women had all of these new dynamics these it, that were all acceptable, right? But if men did anything other than work full time, it was considered a travesty of justice. Like men were inherently a problem, right? So, so marriage was redefined between the late '60s and the 1980s in a way that suited women because what it did is it allowed it allowed them to enjoy the privilege of shifting to whatever position they wanted to. But they didn't have any responsibilities. As a matter of fact, any kind of responsibility on their part was looked at as a form of oppression. So if you talk about duty in marriage, right, duty in any kind of way in terms of your obligation to your husband, that was seen negatively. But we had no problem talking about duty and obligation for men in marriage. Your duty and obligation was protect, provide. And and even if you were in a religious context, minister, you know, to your family, to the extent that you didn't violate whatever she you know regarded as her space uh but they look good on paper you can you can minister to the family but these were the ideas right you had to protect provide and in some cases minister um but as far as women were concerned they really had no forthright duties anymore any kind of duty was is viewed as negative so it, it, you, you couldn't say you have a duty to your husband to have sex you couldn't say you had a duty to cook clean or take care of the family you you couldn't have they didn't have a duty to provide they had no You know, they could they had the freedom to kind of cherry pick from gender roles what they wanted for men's and women's gender roles. But when it came to obligation or duty, that was all on men and women were free to create it as they they saw fit. 
And that and that still kind of exists to this day, you know, because when you listen to, to people talk about what marriage is, we have very clear ideas on what men need to do. But when you really get down to brass tacks, what are women's responsibilities and what women what responsibilities do you hear women talking about uh, that they have in marriage? You'll find very few that can lay that out. Even during the dating phase, you find very few that can lay it, lay it out in dating. I mean, you're, you're expected to provide and, and pay for the dates and and come up with creative and romantic ways to sweep her off her feet. What are her obligations? And if we really want to take it further, that even applies to the bedroom. Men's sexual value is often defined on how he can make her feel right. What he can do to And this starts young. This starts in middle school and in high school, you know, where you have boys that are expected to know what to do. And, you know, if a girl doesn't know what to do, you know, it, it, it kind of goes with her chastity. But if a man doesn't know what to do or a male doesn't know what to do at any age, it's a problem. And right. that continues on even into adulthood. You know, you have to please her. And many black men have been socialized in a way where our very uh, the way we even define our masculinity is based on how well we can pe- appease and please women. That, uh, that becomes the measure of our masculinity in, in many ways which is one of the unique things about the manosphere where the conversation is shifting and men are saying, well, wait a minute, what exactly do I get out of this? You know what I mean? Right. So if we have sex for four hours straight and I'm, you know, I'm doing things to you and you're screaming and your hair is popping off and your toenails. Is pop- what exactly do I get? And the answer is pretty much you get to be with her. So your, right. your obligation to her is your reward. Her reward is, yes is whatever you do to her and if you don't meet her standard she goes to find another uh and you you know your reputation might even suffer but it's a <laughs> one way it's a one way dynamic and that's yes. kind of the problem so from from how we interpret sex even mm-hmm. to you know how it works out in marriage it ends up kind of building off of that so you you know by the time you even get married you know again your your value is not only based on how well you can provide but how well you function in bed but it's a one way value Mm-hmm. It's, it's it's not considered a two way street, really. Let me let me uh, let me ask you. Uh, you make a, a great point that you know women are obligated to do anything, but men are. So when you were in your five year sexless marriage, you were required to still. I'm I'm assuming you 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 couldn't be like okay, well look, you're not gonna <laughs> give me the boot. Okay, cool. I'm not paying the house no. <laughs> nah, man, that wasn't. I was in grad school, and I was uh, working full time plus three part time jobs. And you know, if, if the and if there were occasions when the when the power was out because I couldn't afford it, you know, there are all kinds of situations like that. Being in grad school and you kind of you know juggling bills and trying to keep things afloat, I almost had to drop out a couple times just you know covering the family. I had a newborn son. Um, if there was a problem, everybody looked at me, you know, she, if there was never a point where somebody looked at her and said, well, where, where, where's the light bill? No, her family, my family, her, you know, anyone called me, what, why isn't this, you know, happening? So the, the onus is definitely on men and, you know, the social, mm-hmm. the social expectation remains on men. And this is part of the problem now you know, in relationships and in marriages, men's, you know, social role hasn't changed in the last 70 years it's still the same hell we still got the same birth control options we had in the 50s so nothing has really changed in terms of what's expected of us but everything has changed in terms of what's expected for or, or what women believe they can do it's it's a very one-sided dynamic so it was kind of inevitable that that you know marriage was going to split and i've been one to say that in many men black men led the charge on what i consider to be a silent protest of marriage since the 70s because once you added in the family court once you added in no fault divorce, once you added in, you know, all these these components where the state begins to come in and begins to legislate the marriage on her behalf or, uh, you know, divvy up what remains of the marriage on, on the disillusion of the marriage in her interest, whether it's child support, whether it's alimony, uh, where whatever it is, it becomes a problem. I mean, I have a, I have mentors right now who are in their 70s, women in particular who have men they married in the ninth, early 1980s and divorced in the 80s who are still paying alimony to this day. You know what Whoa. I mean? Yes, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous, but these are the kind of standards in place. So the punishment for men of, of not living up to these social expectations is enforced by law. 
it's not just an arbitrary thing. It's not just, you know, you know, somebody talks about you and your reputation is sullied after. No, these things are impacting you through courts of law. And you can be punished if you don't maintain whatever the the, the levy judgment is. Um, and, and that's a problem. And that's one of the things that was so impactful when the lead attorney in your interview with him said that in places like Texas and in Georgia, you know, divorce, you got a jury. Right. So and the jury's mostly comprised of women. And he's saying these women are deciding what you're going to have to pay when your marriage is up. You, you know how, that knocked me out of my chair. You know, how, I mean, it's bad enough to have a judge arbitrarily give the majority of of whatever your, you know, whatever the marriage disillusion re results in for her, but to have a jury add in, especially in an environment where manhood and maleness is inherently considered a negative, you know, where husbands are automatically considered guilty, even if they haven't cheated or done anything like that, they're considered guilty for not figuring out how to make their wives happy. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to um, kind of go back to this situation where, you know, when you're in this, you know, sort of relationship, um, is there any, like, I mean, at least for you, was there any dating at least or, um, you mean you, me dating her? Yeah, I mean, with any talking her? like, you know, Hey, how you doing, baby? Nothing like that. Uh, I mean, we were we weren't hostile. I mean, it was we we would cover the events of the day, especially as they pertain to my son. Mm -hmm. But uh, beyond that, no. Nah. She didn't want the divorce. She didn't want a divorce. No, um, that was one. You know, we both were children of divorce, and that was one thing. You know, again, that was one of those kind of things we had promised ourselves as children. Like we were individually children, we didn't want to subject our children to divorce. So we both agreed on that, even though we had never discussed it. And well, we did eventually, but we most of the marriage, we hadn't discussed it. It was just something we both believed. But that left us in a position where, you know, we're both just staying somewhere. And that became a problem. So let me ask you this, then. Here's the big question for, you know, in, in the manosphere, if you look at the manosphere, kind of. And we don't really deal with a lot of, um, you know, None, none of our a lot of our content is 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 catered toward guys who are in relationships mm -hmm. um are married but it's more uh suitable for guys that are single picking up chicks and things like that that tends right. to be more of the culture here right i think it's been as of maybe in the last year that we're talking about um you know getting back with an ex as much or relationships stuff like that so we would we would give a a the uh, antidote are, are, are basically we would diagnose the situation as okay if she isn't sleeping with you right possibly right right there's definitely probably no no there's a good probability there's someone else in your experience from people that you know that have gone through these sexless marriages is the woman saying okay well you know i'm just not ready to have sex with you for right now but you find out later on that indeed there is someone else that 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 she is involved with you know that's a that's a really good question man because i know online it's popular to say that and if you don't if you don't say that she's cheating it's looked at like you you, you know you're a blue pill you you, you really never you, you never really understood what she was really doing so it, it, it becomes this kind of thing where you have to be able to say she's cheating or whatever to be honest with you, the majority of the time that I've actually talked to men, and I've probably talked to a good three or four dozen over the last five years, it's rarely that. I mean, it, it can be. I'm not arguing that. It very well can be, but it doesn't have to be. You know, at, you know, again, at the end of the day, when you're talking about a community that doesn't really know what marriage is, you know, here's the thing. You, you, for women in particular, they're, they're socially rewarded, particularly by other women. For getting married right uh in terms of you know and i've heard women talk about this where women who are married will talk down to women who have never been married right so there's this kind of hierarchy right of social value mm -hmm. where marriage is higher for women that have actually gotten the ring and then you know it, there there is a place for women who who count how many proposals they get so they you know they kind of treat that like that's supposed to mean something but there is this kind of social hierarchy now for women that that, that are married and have gone through this, it doesn't have to necessarily mean 
that they've had affairs. You know, some of them just shut down because, again, we've been socialized to get married. There's social value for women who get married. But what I found is a lot of people get married and stop. They know how to seduce someone. They know how to woo someone. They know uh, about you know what they've seen on TV about the romance of the wedding itself. Hell, the wedding industry don't even they don't really even talk to the men. You walk into an establishment with your fiance to, to, <laughs> for to get a dress or to find a wedding. They talk to her, right? And, and right. then they give you the price, and you just got to go figure out. So, <laughs> so all of this has nothing. You know, men are not a factor in that regard. So all right. of this is building up this whole idea about what it means to get married, but many right. of us have never learned what marriage is. So the day after the wedding, you know, the day after the honeymoon is over, mm-hmm. you know, you, you, you'd be surprised how many people's personality radically shifts because we've spent the majority of our lives with a particular understanding about what it takes to get married and what it's supposed to feel like, but we have no understanding of what daily marital life is supposed to look like. And so it, much of the time we use a rubric that doesn't fit and I mean, again, nearly 80 percent of marriage, marriage divorces are initiated by women. So, you know, a lot of it has to do with how women are socialized. Men, in my opinion, you know, yeah, we, we, we do have a tendency to over romanticize when you talk about blue pill. That's very real. But even in the midst of all of that, I think men often have a more practical understanding of a day to day dynamic, even when we get bored, even when we have to work through those things. But we're not raised from childhood playing with dolls thinking about marriage that's not how we we come into marriage most men are not thinking about it since five years old wondering what their wife is going to look like that's not how usually that goes um Mm -hmm. i think chris rock kind of said it best we we kind of we 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 go out we eat we go see a movie we out we you know after a while we do it long enough we're like okay she's cool you know we can do this you know, men kind of, <laughs> men, you know we we very rarely come into it with a kind of romanticization of of the but you know for women it's very different you know so you know those kind of things end up impacting day-to-day life and 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 i think this movement that we're seeing from the manosphere now about redefining uh you know sexual marketplace value or defining it you know and really helping us understand i think that's important not just by itself but in terms of what it can mean because what i think it forces us to deal with is your value and especially if you're a pretty woman and you've been pretty all your life most of those women are not prepared for what happens when the social value drops. They're really not. The sexual value drops. They're not. So they come into this in many times believing, okay, well, if he doesn't make me happy, I can be 50 years old. We can be married for 20 plus years. I can leave him and do better. I mean, this is, we have this kind of dynamic in place where women kind of believe that no matter when in their lives they decide to, they can always level up. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that they've always had a certain amount of attention, especially again, especially if they're socially, you know, considered uh, beautiful, if they're if they're considered pretty in any measure, they kind of are, are raised with this sensibility, uh, and you know, it, it's not realistic, but it's what they're familiar with. And when you add in uh, social media, right, where they're getting attention just for existing, all of that promotes an entitlement and a belief that no matter you know how old they are, no matter when it is, she can level up. And a lot more of the time than not, she finds out the hard way that she, you know, that her husband was actually the better bet, but she's not going to admit it. And and women in general don't admit it. There's not a conversation for that, you know, because, again, the narrative is get divorced and go live your best life, girl. For men, you know, it's a very different dynamic. But this is what we're this is what we're dealing with. I mean, so there's no sense of sexual marketplace value. And and by the time it hits, you know, for most women, they don't know where to go with it. Right. Because I like, for example, I had a, a friend, a female friend I'd known from college. And I remember when she was 41 years old, I remember she called me from a club. She lived out of state. She called me late one night from a club crying. And I said, well, what's the problem? She said, well, none of the men will buy me drinks. And, I'm, and she's half drunk. So I'm like, why are you calling me about this? You know, uh-huh. and she was saying, well, I remember when they were, and now they're buying all the 20 year old girls at the bar drinks and none of them will buy me a drink. I said, well, I've known you for 20 years. Did you care when you were the pretty hot young thing at the bar getting drinks and the 40 year old women looking behind you were pissed off? Did you care about them then? She said, no. I said, well, you can't care about it now. It is what it is. You know, but that was that, you know, but it never dawned on her that there would be a day 
where mm-hmm. she was going, you know, because she was always pretty. And you know, so it never hit her that there would right. be a day where she would hit what we call the wall. There was no framework for the wall. We didn't have that language at the time. So she mm-hmm. didn't understand it. And then all of a sudden she was complaining about 60 year old men that were hitting on her. And I'm like, well, to them, you still the hot young thing. I mean, you didn't, <laughs> you didn't mind it 20 years ago. Those are the same dudes and they have more resources. So, you know, but. But the reality is she's competing with the 20 year old women for the same dudes, you know, right. it was the same guys that she has in mind. And there was no sense that in 20 years, anything had really changed for her. She still saw herself as the 20 year old gar- girl at the bar. It, you know, th- so when you kind of have that kind of framework in place, it's hard to get some people to understand. Look, the guy you married to, you need to figure it out. That's nine times out of 10. That's probably the best bet. That's on. That's the man on your level. That's the man you got to work it out with. By the time you leave a marriage with kids, look, it's not to say women can't get remarried or find another man. They can do that pretty easily. It's just a question of whether or not they can marry the one they want. And that's where we hit a wall. They can get men easily. They just can't get easily the men they want. Competition is much higher. That's where the rubber hits the surface. And, you know, just as a side, as an aside, fellas, don't ever be the one that she, you know, she kind of settles for. Because that doesn't go well, you know. Let me let me ask you this because I'm glad you mentioned that part. You know, being the guy that she settles for, um, you know, we talked about that. I, I, you know, when you were becoming, you know, not Dr. T. S. Son Johnson, the graduate student, but Dr. T. S. Son Johnson, Dr. T. S. Son Johnson, the PhD. Then all of a sudden, the women that were not on your level, or you were not on their level. Now, now they want to talk to you now because you have those those letters in your name. So and I'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of guys, um, you know, would would be the ones that are settling for a woman like that. And I can easily see how that can become a sexless marriage because, you know, you're the guy that she didn't want in the first place. Do you think yeah. that a lot of men who are in sexless relationships or sexless marriages are the guys who women had to settle for and then they're resenting it? Could that be a reason? That can, also? that can definitely happen. You know, you as far as she's concerned, because you always had her on a pedestal or women that women like her on a pedestal that you're going to, you know, overvalue her the way she does. And in that way, she can still get married. She can do, still live a certain quality of life. Or, you know, it, yeah, there are definitely those kind of situations. But uh, as you say, in the bedroom, there's not a lot of genuine desire that can definitely happen. All I'm saying about this dynamic, though, is there are a lot of issues. There are a lot of reasons. It's not just one. And I, and I know we like to get comfortable and we like to say, you know, yes, it's because she's seeing someone else or yes, it's because, you know, you were the educated lame and she settled for you. Those do happen. Not mm-hmm. denying that by any measure. But I am saying there are other dynamics that we got to you know bring into play as well. And one mm-hmm. of the biggest ones are the way we're socialized to think about relationships and marriage as it as a, at all as a, just the way we define it we have to be able to bring in some of these other issues because what we end up doing is just taking one trope and applying it across the board to too many different things and we just can't we we, we really got to broaden that out a little um because you know to the guy who's coming to the manosphere for answers even if he's ha- hired a, a detective or whatever and finds out his wife actually isn't cheating um yet she doesn't want to touch him well you know the do we just keep telling him that his wife is cheating on him or, or, well, then, well, she's having an emotional affair with someone. Okay. Well, maybe, but at the end of the day, there are a lot of different factors that come into play. And I think the thing that, that might be most helpful in my opinion for men is for them to understand their true social value, you know, whatever that may be. And that sexual marketplace value is a significant part of that. We got to really have real conversations about where we are to have a better understanding of how we interact with people. It's always a good thing for men to improve themselves always across the board that one i will definitely say um and and have as a real as much of a realistic view on the relationship you're in as possible as possible um but one of the things that i i also warn men about is when you start dealing with uh conversations in public when you start dealing with the therapy industry you know sex therapy in particular when you start dealing with people who talk about marriage in general a lot of it is framed in a in a manner that that immediately positions the man as the problem and that's mm-hmm. what that's one of the things I want men to to be able to challenge, because a lot, you know, some of these things have nothing to do with you whatsoever. And and, and in, in that regard, we got to be be able to uh, to challenge these narratives that make men the problem and leave men unhappy in situations where they they followed their social contract. 
You know what I mean? And that's one of the things I think we're coming to. We're realizing the social the social contract is the problem in and of itself because it doesn't lend to the conclusion we'd like to get to. But we still got to have some very real conversations about how we get to these points and break out of this narrative uh, that's inherently misandered. Mm-hmm. Doc, you've also killed it again, man. I, I, you know, you're a really, really talented uh, brother. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to get some more money to try to keep bribing you to come on the platform, Doc. But, you know, you, you have a new uh, entry um, that's coming into the Institute of Black Male Studies. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to uh, talk about this two-part webinar, mm-hmm. the 10 policies that broke up the black family American art. Let's talk about that real quick mm-hmm. in, uh, in your website over there. Well, I appreciate that, man. We um, it, basically it's, you know, it, we in the last interview we did, or we talked a little bit about it. I only mentioned one out of the 10 uh, policies, but that's one of the, the big things. When I talk about socialization, how we're socialized, a lot of that is also aligned with policy. Right. So w- what we're dealing with are not just individual issues with the one woman we're dealing with or the couple of women we dated. You know, we're actually dealing with how mass groups have been socialized in a particular direction and how that socialization is spurned by policy, by law. So when I was talking earlier about uh, divorce, right, and and, and the and the and the impact of the family court in the mid 1970s, the power of that was was not just that women wanted to get divorced, but the punitive practices that courts brought in and levied against men that had a that had an impact on women's behaviors, women's worldviews and outlooks about marriage and their their value. It had an, 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 an ne- mostly a negative impact on men. We have to be able to look at this stuff and really see it beyond just the individual situation with the woman you were married to and got a divorce from, or, or maybe you met a couple that seemed very similar. But really what we're saying is their value systems have been crafted by uh, everything from how they've been socialized within families, often generation of fem- generations of female-led households that have a particular set of worldviews about the value of women over the value of men. But those values are often predicated on policies that advanced women to the detriment of men, particularly in the Black community. So when we start to see how our environment impacts the way we interact, the way we see the world, the way we marry, the way we divorce, the way we date, the way we have sex, the way we eat, all of these things in many ways. I'm not saying they're controlled strictly by socialization and policy, but they are heavily influenced. And when you start to see it from that vantage point, then it makes sense why there's so many men that can come into this space and say, I've had the same experience. Why you can talk to so many divorced men who could say I've had the same experience. Why you can even talk to so many men that have been in sexless marriages because the sense of of gender roles, responsibilities, or even um, duty in marriage doesn't exist for women. It exists for men. There's some generic ones about women and childcare, but even that's being offset. There are no static, you know, kind of expectations of women, but there are plenty of them for men. Well, that's a product of socialization and policy. Right. Once those things shifted and then you fast forward a couple of generations now, you know, not having a standard for what a wife is supposed to do is considered fairly common. I mean, again, even when you're dating for the first time and just kind of meeting a woman, you know, and you have these conversations and she's vetting you to see if you're a good provider. Most men that I've come into contact with, especially my students, don't really have a frame of reference on how to vet a woman and what to vet her for. I mean, we look to see if she looks good, but, you know, we, it, there's not a lot. Women have a clear cut set, a rubric that they use to measure your value. We often, you know, especially when we were younger, we didn't have one. Right. It, it, but again, a lot of these are predicated on environmental issues. And I just want to kind of get that across. So the 10 policies that broke up the American family kind of provide the foundational policies, you know, that I think undergird. Uh, the practices, the worldviews and the values that generations of female led families will pass on to their daughters, their daughters, daughters and so on and so forth. I think we got to be able to first start with the policy. What were the major influences and then look at how that affected how we interact, because it really kicks in with Generation X. You know, it really kicks in the boomers kind of uh, initiated Generation X is the first generation where you see it. Um, you know, raised in a context of all of these policies, you know, and, and I think they hit between the late 60s and the early 80s. So you have a cross section of these 10 policies that hit at the same time. And Generation X is the one that really comes up in a context where they're influenced by all of these. 
And then from there, the millennials and everyone else is kind of responding to what Generation X brings to bear. And it's not always a good response. So I talk about that in this series and you can find it on the Institute for Black Male Studies website um, and, you know, check it out. All right. So I'll leave the link to this to the uh, first company at the top. Again, I do thank Dr. T.S. Johnson for coming on and talking with us again. It's an excellent interview. Um, I don't know if it's good as the last one, but it's close. It's really good. So Doc really right. brings it and he really opens things up. So guys, make sure you subscribe to Dr. C.S. Johnson. Um, hopefully we'll be working together again. Uh, if not this channel, but the other channel, but he will be back. Um, I'm, I'm looking for stuff to bring him back. So guys, thank you for supporting us, supporting the Black Man. And as you know, the buffoon remains at an all-time high. I'm out. Mm-hmm.